All right, welcome to everyone who's attending with us online tonight. The Thunder Bay Museum is on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, a signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. We recognize that the story of this region goes back much farther than settlement, and our history inc includes contributions of many Indigenous peoples and communities over the centuries. As we are part participating from home or other private spaces tonight, I encourage you to reflect on the history of the land you're on and its first peoples. We also have a full slate of public lectures arranged for this year. All will be available online. Some may also be held in person at the museum, depending on how the public health situation is changing. I'll ask you to keep your calendar marked for November 24th next month, when Kathy Woodbeck will be talking about the history of the Thunder Bay Multicultural Society. During tonight's session, please feel free to make use of the Q&A feature on Zoom. We'll make sure there is lots of opportunity for questions to be asked and answered. If you're having any technical difficulties, please let us know as well. And tonight's lecture is being recorded, um, just so everyone is aware of that. Tonight's lecture is given by Ted Glenn. Ted is an author and educator who splits his time between Toronto and Gray County, Ontario. By day, he teaches Canadian government at, at Humber College. His passion is writing about the interstices of Canadian history. His work includes the book, Riding into Battle, Canadian Cyclists in the Great War. The article, Lawrence of Canada, how the legend of the dashing British First World War hero went through a test run in Toronto. And the book embedded two journalists, a burlesque star and the expedition to oust Louis, Louis Riel. Ted is currently working on understanding the inner machinations of Canada's sixth ministry. Thanks very much for being here, Ted, and I can turn it over to you now. Thanks, Sarah, I appreciate the uh, introduction. Uh, and it's, it's very good of you to have me here uh, tonight. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone else who's uh, uh, joining us tonight or on a recorded version later on. Uh, and just to note that this in fact is the 150th anniversary of Colonel Garnet Wolseley's expedition to Red River. So the timing is impeccable. So it's my privilege this evening to present a short lecture on the expedition as seen through the eyes of two journalists <clears throat> and one burlesque star who were embedded with it. My goal is to talk for about 45 minutes and then leave some questions, uh, uh, some time for questions afterwards. And as Sarah said, uh, more than welcome to use the Q&A function on the Zoom to do that. And so, without further ado, let's get on with the show. So after nearly a decade, negotiations for the sale of Rupert's land were grinding to an end in the spring of 1868. At stake were nearly 1.5 million <clears throat> square miles stretching from Labrador in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west to Baffin Island in the north and the 49th parallel to the south. To prepare for the transfer, Dominion Public Works Minister William McDougall began work on plans to connect the end of the shipping lanes at Lake Superior to the settlement at Red River. Senior engineer Simon Dawson recommended using an old northwest canoe route linking Superior on the east by a new road to Shabandouin Lake, and on the west by a new road from Lake of the Woods to Fort Gary. McDougall liked the plan and contracted Dawson uh, to build the eastern road and another engineer named John Allen Snow the western. In July 1869, Parliament ratified the Rupert's deal, the Rupert's land deal, and this sets December the 1st, 1869 as the closing date. Parliament also passed legislation establishing a temporary government for the Northwest Territories. For all his work, Prime Minister MacDonald named William McDougall the new governor. Ottawa's plans weren't well received in Red River. In August, news of McDougall's appointment as Lieutenant Governor reached the settlement right just as Dominion survey crews arrived. Local residents, about 5,700 French-speaking Métis, about 4,100 English-speaking Métis, and most of the 1,600 white settlers felt betrayed. They'd neither been consulted on the sale of their land nor involved in choosing their governor. In October, the agitation came to a head. Longtime resident André Noll found a survey crew at work on his hay privilege and rushed to find his bilingual cousin, Louis Riel, to help him figure out what was going on. Riel returned with 18 mounted Métis. He stood famously on the survey chain and he told the crew, the territory south of the Assiniboine River belongs to the people of Red River and not to Canada. 
the Métis would not allow the survey to proceed any further. Meanwhile, McDougall was on his way from Ottawa to take up his new duties in Red River. On October 31, he reached the border at Pembina, where he was met by a courier with a message from Louis Riel. Sir, the National Committee of the Métis of Red River orders you not to enter the territory of the Northwest without special permission of the above-mentioned committee. McDougall was enraged. He tore a strip off the messenger and pushed his way on into the territory, straight up against Ambois de Diem Lepin, a mountain of a man, and his posse who'd been ordered to intercept McDougall and, in, and escort him out of the settlement. On his way out, Lepin told McDougall, you must not return beyond this line. McDougall, without military or even a security detail, had no choice but to leave. While McDougall cooled his heels at Pembina, 100 armed Métis stormed Fort Gary and took control of the Hudson's Bay food and munitions stored there. In a show of loyalty to McDougall and the Dominion government, local businessman and agitator John Schultz organized a group of 45 men and women at his store. On December 7, Riel responded to the threat. At two in the morning, 200 armed troops moved on Schultz's house and trained two cannons on the main door. The loyalists surrendered immediately and were marched under guard to imprisonment at Fort Geary. The rebellion at Red River spooked the Dominion government. Prime Minister Macdonald tried to buy time to prepare to send a military force to Red River in the spring. First, he got London to postpone the transfer of Rupert's land until peaceable possession could be guaranteed. And then emissaries to Red River, uh, and then he sent emissaries to Red River to assure locals that their rights wouldn't be affected. Then his government got to work on the expedition. Simon Dawson was ordered to complete construction of the road for Thunder Bay to Shabandouin Lake. Two steamers, the Algoma and the Chippewa, were contracted to ferry men and materiel from Collingwood to Fort William on Thunder Bay. Shipyards in Ontario and Quebec were contracted to build 140 boats to convey troops across the old Northwest route to Red River. And Great Britain was persuaded to participate in the mission, Macdonald arguing the insurgents would more readily lay down their arms to a British force than one entirely. In January, Riel convened the Convention of 40 to draw up the terms for negotiating union with Canada. By early February, these were completed and the delegates were chosen to send to Ottawa. Riel agreed to release the remaining prisoners taken at Schultz's store back in December. Unfortunately, news of the prisoners' release was slow to get out. On February 12, 60 armed men left Portage La Prairie for Fort Gary behind Major Charles Bolton with plans to spring the prisoners. When Riel heard they'd reached Kildonan near Winnipeg, he was furious and he sent a messenger telling them to disperse as all the prisoners had been released. Bolton's crew agreed but chose to make a point of marching home directly beside Métis headquarters at Fort Gary. As expected, a troop of guardsmen rode out and took Bolton and his men prisoner on February 17. Among Bolton's men was a hot-headed Irishman named Thomas Scott. Witnesses said the Orangemen attacked his guards, taunted them with racial slurs, and threatened to kill Riel. To shut him up, two guards dragged Scott from his cell and beat him senseless. And yet, despite more warnings and a personal entity from Riel for peace, Scott wouldn't shut up. Riel had him placed in irons on March 1, and on the 3rd brought him before a military tribunal headed by uh, Lapine and including Andre Noel, and Elzio Goulet. Scott was charged with taking up arms against the provincial government and striking his guards. The tribunal issued, issued a death, death penalty, and the next day, No and Goulet retrieved Scott from his cell. He was led through the main gate to a firing squad waiting outside the fort. Scott's body was never found. The execution of Thomas Scott ignited a firestorm of rage and indignation across Protestants in Ontario. Tens of Indignation meetings sprang up where action was demanded from the government. The largest meeting was actually held in Toronto on April 6, where 10,000 people packed the square in front of City Hall and demanded Riel and his French Catholic government be put down. After that, plans for the expedition fell quickly into place, many hoping it would deliver the vengeance that they were seeking. First, Colonel Garnet Wolseley, an up-and-coming British officer who'd been stationed in Canada for the past few years, was named head of the expedition. Canada agreed to contribute 705 soldiers, raising two battalions from militia units in Ontario and Quebec. These began arriving in Toronto on May the 2nd for inspection and training. 
and Britain confirmed it would send 19 soldiers from the Royal Artillery, 19 Royal Engineers, and 352 infantry from the 1st Battalion 60th Rifles. While Wolseley waited for the ice to clear from the Great Lakes, negotiations with the Red River delegates finished in early May with an agreement to create Canada's fifth province, Manitoba. The steamer El Goma was readying to depart from the tiny port of Collingwood on the southern shores of Georgian Bay as the Manitoba Act was introduced into the House of Commons on May the 2nd. By that point, Garnet Wolseley's expedition to Red River was already the story of the year, and Canadian newspaper publishers were jockeying to sell it. The most enterprising were George Brown of the Globe and John Ross Robertson of the Daily Telegraph, both from Toronto. In April 1870, the two arranged to have the reporters accompany Wolsey all the way from Toronto to Fort Geary. Malin St. Jean was the Globe's special correspondent. He'd been a Royal Marine who'd seen action in China in the Battle of Canton in 1857 and in the Pig War against the Americans in 1859. He'd been on the Globe's editorial board since immigrating to Canada in 1868. St. John got the assignment because John Ross Robertson had just stole Robert Cunningham away from the Globe. Cunningham was actually the Globe's first reporter on the Northwest Beat. And back in December 1869, he traveled the Red River to interview Louis Riel. He got the interview, but was then thrown in jail, expelled from the settlement, and warned by Riel never to return. But return he did, as our commissioner for the Daily Telegraph. St. John and Cunningham were the only two civilians embedded with Wolseley's expedition. The third was St. John's wife, Kate Brunel. Brunel was an English-born, Paris-raised burlesque star who'd immigrated to Canada with St. John in 1868. An audience favorite in the theaters and music halls of Montreal and Toronto, she somehow finagled her way into accompanying St. John on the journey to Red River. And it was lucky for him that she did. Just out of Thunder Bay, St. John injured his hand and had to rely on Renault to ghostwrite the Globe's coverage the rest of the way. On May 3rd, Cunningham, St. John, and Renault took the Great Northern Railway from Toronto to Collingwood, where they found the tiny port a whirlwind of activity. Trains had been running nonstop from Toronto for the previous four days, and expedition cargo spilled along the shore and narrow wharf jutting into the bay. Moored to the wharf were Dawson's two steamers, the Algoma and the Chikara. The men there were focused on loading the Algoma with all the non-military equipment Dawson needed to complete his road to Shabandalin Lake. Wagons, horses, oxen, hay, fodder, and all manner of construction equipment such as wheelbarrows, spades, picks, and axes. Expedition officials had a hunch the U.S. government was going to deny military vessels passage through its canal at Sault Ste. Marie as part of an ongoing dispute with Great Britain. Officials thought if Dawson and his crew could make it through the canal, they at least could get the road to Shabandwin finished before the troops arrived. And hopefully that would buy diplomats in Ottawa and London and Washington enough time to resolve their dispute and allow the Chikara and the first load of military material to travel through the canal. The hunch paid off. Early on May 5th, the Algoma steamed peacefully through the Sioux Canal and made her way for Fort William and molested, anticipating a different sort of welcome for the Chikara and its load of military material. Cunningham elected to stay on at the Sioux while St. John and Rano traveled on to Thunder Bay. The Algoma sighted Ile Royale late Saturday afternoon and came into the tiny village of Government Station, five miles east of Fort William in the middle of the night. The waters there were too shallow for the Algoma to tie up directly to the small wharf, so she anchored, anchored 300 yards offshore, and a tow line was run in along which a flat bottom scow was soon ferrying freight. When the work was completed Monday, the captain raised anchor and set course back to the Sioux, and Dawson's men marched up the road to get on with their work. All thought the Algoma would return in the next few days, and that perhaps the diplomats would resolve the crisis and the Chikara would return as well. But it wouldn't be until May 26th that Thunder Bay would be connected to the outside world again. Until then, St. John, Renault, and Dawson's crew would live as a party of isolated backwoodsmen, as St. John described them. 
When St. John and Rhino arrived, Government Station was a small but pretty village. At the center was a British ensign flapping in the breeze with 10 or so wooden houses scattered around. One served as government headquarters, another four were stores of different varieties, and another four or five were private houses. To the west were the tents of Dawson's camp. With nothing else to do, St. John joined senior engineer Lindsay Russell to see firsthand the state of Dawson's famous road. They set off in a four wheel buggy on the morning of Wednesday, May 11. St. John said the first section of the road to the Kamenistakwa Bridge at mile 21 was the most developed. The next 20 miles to Strawberry Creek was a succession of level stretches and easy gradations of ascent and descent. In some places, Dawson's men had removed groves of trees and blasted stumps. In other low-lying areas, they built fascine or corduroy of logs covered with earth. West from Strawberry Creek at mile 20, the road wound down a long winding hill into the Kamenistakwa Valley and across a bridge over which heavy wagons and artillery could pass. From the Kamenistikwa Bridge to the Madawan Bridge at mile 26, the road then went over a long red marl hill. At Sunshine Creek, the road crossed a temporary bridge and entered the woods for 11 miles when it strikes the Oskandagi at mile 39. Parts of this section were good. Some are as yet in the first stages. St. John said most of the ground was covered in moss there. It is in fact in a state of nature the trees only having been removed. The Oskandagi River was as far as the road reached on May the 11th. On Monday, May 16, news reached government station of a fire raging in the woods. St. John left with Russell the next day to inspect the damage. They got as far as Six Mile Creek when the roar of a fire became audible and vast columns of black smoke rose leeward of the bridge. A gale force wind had picked up from the west, driving hawks and other birds before it. Very quickly, the road was blocked with thick smoke. Discretion, wrote St. John, required an early movement. The men turned back toward the bay, but made it only a mile or so when they saw a second fire had started from a point about 10 miles to the westward of Government Station. From their vantage point on top of the hill, they could see this second fire was in the process of joining the first and was spreading quickly to the windward of us. Rather than make a break for it through a quickly closing window between the two fires, Russell and St. John decided to proceed by way of brulees or the already burned patches of the forest. A mile or so on, Russell and St. John took temporary refuge in a clearing made by an old Frenchman huddled with his wife and five children outside their shanty. Their eyes were swollen and streaming from the effects of the smoke. St. John said the man built some hope on the fact of there being a swamp between his home and the fire. His wife and children, though, seemed to know that the thickly wooded belt on which he trusted would not stop the fire for a second. Russell and St. John pushed on, anxious to, anxious to reach Government Station, knowing it would be shortly attacked by the fire. At the next brulee, groves of beech were ablaze all around, giving off thick rolling clouds of party-colored smoke, until it was impossible to discern anything except in the immediate vicinity or to form any opinion as to where the fire was or was not burning. Russell and St. John made a dash for it, passing another beech grove engulfed in flame until they were forced to stop. The smoke was so thick here they were unable to see one another, though hardly a yard apart. Breathing was also difficult, and feeling the rush of hot air from the fire on either side, we judged it wiser to turn back while we were able and regain the clearing. Sticking to the brulees, Russell and St. John found their way back to the road, and from there they could see over a breadth of several miles how the fire had burned shanties, bridges, and even earth-colored culverts, and rushing on had joined the fire from the Madeline. It took them over an hour, but eventually Russell and St. John got back down to Government Station, where they found all the men turned out, and a line of points drawn at which the uh, fight with the fire was to be made. The horses had been removed from the stables and picketed as far from the danger as possible. The men drew water from the bay by the cask. Depots were filled all along the boundary of the woods, and buildings, particularly the stables and the houses, were drenched as the raging fire hemmed them in on three sides. Every exertion would now be necessary to save home and property, if not life itself, said St. John. Just after one o'clock, the fire burst through the edge of the forest and spread along the partially cleared land of the settlement, seizing upon every trunk, shrub, log, and stump along the line of the clearing. Where there was grass or undergrowth, the flames were able to lick right to the water's edge. The men were too late to save one woman's small house. The flames attacked the ground logs, sprung upon the roof, and raced around the edges. Water seemed only to heighten its fury. And in a few minutes, the poor woman's house was a smoldering ruin. 
At some point, the wind shifted and long tongues of flame reached for the center of the village, testing the worth and endurance of each man to the utmost. For three hours, the men fought through blinding and choking smoke. As soon as they were successful in one spot, the fire sprang up in another, as if by invisible hands. Hordewood stacked on the wharf caught fire, and sparks from it set ablaze everything that was made of wood around the central buildings. It was here that the men made a last stand, marshalling the greatest exertions necessary to save the houses themselves. They went into the black smoke to cast water on the fire, little knowing whether they would come out of it again, and others threw themselves on the ground to get a breath of air. Russell ordered all gunpowder to be thrown into the bay, alongside all the tool chests and personal effects already dumped there. Eventually, with the wind's help, the fire was at last got under. The exhausted crew watched it roar off down the bay. A couple days later, St. John rode back up the road to assess the damage. He said the fire had consumed the greater part of the country, between the bay and Shabandoan Lake, between 40 and 50 miles. All the smaller bridges along the road, even many of the earth-covered cul culverts and corduroy sections had been destroyed. Meanwhile, in Washington, diplomats were successful in hammering out an agreement that would allow military vessels through the Sioux Canal. The Canadian government immediately chartered six more steamers, four schooners, two gunboats, two tugs, and a flotilla of barges, rafts, and scows to get the expedition back on track. It would be all decks on hand to transport the expedition's 1,100 troops, 700 voyageurs, guides, scouts, teamsters, and laborers, and thousands of tons of munitions and supplies to Thunder Bay. All told, the fleet would make 19 trips between May 25th and June 26th, when the last of the expedition's supplies were brought up. The Chikara, with Wolseley aboard, was the first to reach government station on May 25. The first thing Wolseley did was rechristen government station Prince Arthur's Landing. Then, he and Lindsay Russell rode up to the Oskandagi to get a handle on the state of Dawson's Road. What he found was pretty much as St. John had described two weeks earlier. The next four miles were still under construction, more than half the next session was only cut through the woods, and the last five miles to Shabandwin Lake hadn't even been marked out through the woods. Wolseley was in a bind. He had orders to leave Fort Garry with the British contingent no later than August 20th, in order to ship back to Britain by Christmas. The imbroglio at the Sioux put that timeline in jeopardy, and now delays on Dawson's Road meant the expedition might not even reach Red River by fall. And an early freeze up could mean British troops wouldn't get home until spring. The pressure on Wolseley could literally be seen building along the shores of Thunder Bay. Between May 26 and June the 3rd, eight vessels disgorged 700 troops, scores of voyageurs and teamsters, tons of stores, supplies, and materiel, and dozens of horses and oxen. On June 3rd, Wolseley came up with an idea to help relieve the pressure. He proposed sending eight boats up the Kamenistikwa River to see if it was feasible to bypass the road and reach the bridge at mile 21 entirely by water. Captain Young and Lieutenant Fraser were put in charge of a small team to oversee the project. Simon Dawson opposed the experiment as a reckless danger to both men and boats. While Young and Fraser labored to move their, boot, their boats up the Kamenistikwa River, particularly around the daunting Kakabeka Falls, Dawson's Transportation Service began moving supplies to the base camp at the Mottawan Bridge at mile 26. Progress was slow as alarming numbers of the horses were falling ill. On June 9, St. John said 20 of the 50 horses available were out of commission with many more rapidly approaching the same state. On top of this were three days of heavy rains that made the road beyond the Kamenistikwa Bridge impassable to the wagon. Lindsay Russell told St. John that the combined effect of the fire, rain, and horses likely meant that no part of the expedition would leave Fort Garry that winter. The only good news in all of this was Young and Fraser had been able to get their boats to the smooth water beyond Kakabaka Falls. Wolseley deemed the experiment a success and ordered a second detachment of boats under Captain Northy to depart up the Kamenistikwa River the next day. On June 10, Wolseley ordered Young and Fraser to see how far they could float their boats up the Madawin River beyond the Kamenistic Bridge. About this time, Cunningham described how the tiny outpost of Government Station had mushroomed from a motley collection of wooden buildings and canvas tents into the bustling port of Brint's Arthur's Landing. Cunningham said the mix of wooden houses, stores, and canvas tents had become very gay and pretty, with 
with many tents sporting green curtains and rustic tables to facilitate toiletries and meals. A number of troops had built poplar fences around their tents and strung up a very numerous assortment of flags. One of these sported a red ensign surrounded by a frying pan, a symbol meant to designate the locality of the regimental kitchen. St. John said streets were marked off between the tents, control road was flanked by control department buildings, bakery lane led to the field ovens, and Ordnance Road was home to the Royal Artillery and Royal Engineers. Shoe Fly Avenue boasted the principal comic vocalist of the upper camp. Shoe Fly, of course, referred to Shoe Fly Don't Bother Me, the popular burlesque ditty just about everyone was whistling and dancing to in the late 1860s and early 1870s. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Not all the soldiers' time <clears throat> was spent working on Dawson's Road. On June 23rd, a much anticipated boat race took place between the Ontario Battalion's number five company and the Royal Engineers. The Ontario crew had recently defeated number seven company for the honor of being the first volunteers to square off against the British regulars. At precisely 7.30, Wolseley fired his pistol to begin the race. The Royal Engineers got off to a strong start, but with a series of splendid spurts and gallant roaring, the number five company crew kept even to about the one mile mark. At that point, the steady stroke of the Ontario men told, and the number five company boat pulled steadily ahead over the last half mile to a distance of more than two lengths by the finish line. The judge, uh, Lieutenant Colonel McNeil, declared the winning time at eight minutes, 47 seconds. Not bad for a bunch of volunteers in a heavy, unwieldy military boat. The gaggle of spectators cheered the crews as they returned to the starting area, and Wolseley complimented each of the Royal Engineers as they stepped ashore. Cunningham identified the last as Jack the Major Maloney. Cunningham said the Major was quite a character, having done, to, done more to give vivacity and good temper to the camp than any other man. His native wit is something prodigious. His salaries are oftentimes irresistible. You just require to look at him to see the kind of man he is. For great round, massive smiles are settled on every feature. Well, once the crews were welcomed back on shore, Cunningham said the major mounted an ad hoc rostrum and addressed the troops after shaking hands with Wolseley. Fellow patriots, you ought to be very proud of the crew of number five boat this night, Maloney began. Why, major? Someone in the crowd asked. Now, don't be in such a hurry, Maloney said. Wasn't I just coming to tell you all about it? But I can assure the owner of that voice that said why, that judging from the voice itself and judging from the face and judging from his part history and judging from his inevitable future history, that it will be a very long time indeed before any gentleman in such a public and gallant assembly as this will have the hardihood to rise and tell such a thundering lie as to say that anybody will ever and can ever be proud of him. Everyone laughed, the major smiled all around. Yes, gentlemen. I say, and I will say it a thousand times if you please, even though I am one of the victims, that you should be proud of us for licking the engineers. That's so, Major, said a young private. Brethren, the child's name is Johnny, Maloney exclaimed. The private collapsed in laughter. And now, gentlemen, I have nearly done, and all that I have to say further is that the crew of number five company are ready to row with any seven men in the brigade. So you'd better get, so you'd better go to bed, like good boys, say your prayers, Always take care in every circumstance in which you may be placed. Behave yourselves like gentlemen, so that you may do honor to your queen, your country, and your mothers. After three cheers for the queen, for Jarvis, for the Royal Engineers, and the number five crew, the major gave up the rostrum and vanished into the crowd. <clears throat> there was no major named Maloney on the expedition, not even a Maloney. I think Cunningham's major was one of the many ruses that he and St. John used when writing about Renault over the course of the expedition. The expedition was actually set to launch from Shibandwan at 10 o'clock Saturday morning, July 16th. As the hour approached though, Cunningham said preparations were still incomplete as many of the boats still required repairs from the dings and knocks and dirt on the rapids and portages up from the bay. St. John said the hijinks didn't help matters one soldier tried to appropriate the gear from another. Someone else complained that his boat had fewer barrels of pork or flour than the others. And then the inevitable fight broke out concerning which belonged to whom or who had more or less than the other. 
The pressure to launch increased as morning bled into afternoon. The control officers marched around with memorandum books in their hands, and the regimental officers barked for sergeant this or corporal that. At several points, it seemed the boats were ready to go, and then some complication or other arose. And then late in the afternoon, Wolseley arrived. <laughs> he made it clear he expected detachments were going to start that night, regardless. Finally, at 8.30, the first boat shoved off from the little wharf at the southeast end of Shabandwin Lake. St. John said it was a beautiful evening. The winds had died down. The lake was calm like a mill pond. The sun had just set in a cloudless sky, leaving the western border of the lake painted with a mellowed tinge of purples and reds. The stillness was broken by shouts of encouragement and goodbyes from the well-wishers on shore. No more rapids, exclaimed one. No more polling, cried another. Off we go for Red River, repeated many. St. John said everybody was in great spirits with the long, dragging, worrisome journey from Thunder Bay now behind them. As soon as the 1st Brigade got underway, the 2nd followed suit with the Royal Artillery and the Royal Engineers. It took another 17 days for the last of the expedition to leave Shabandwin. Around this time, St. John admitted in one of his articles to a temporary inability to hold a pen in any other way but that in which one holds a spoon. On August 3, he said, owing to a disabled hand, I've been able, unable to write. On August 21, he confessed that his crippled arm and the remnants of a lengthened attack of fever and ague had forced him to dictate his stories from his bed. And then, on August 24, St. John revealed that Kate Rano was the one taking the dictation. Quote, my crippled arm prevents me from writing, and though my wife sits patiently writing from my dictations, the joint effort is to us at least hardly satisfactory. It is no easy matter to arrange and dictate the mass of interesting and uninteresting events that pass before one when sickness comes to impede one's efforts. In other words, at least from when they departed Shabandoon Lake on July 16, the Globe's coverage of the Red River Expedition was jointly produced by Kate Rano and Mullen and St. John. Pardon me for a sec. So I'm going to flash forward a bit here to Tuesday, October the, sorry, Tuesday, August 23rd. In just over five weeks, the expedition had traveled 600 miles from Thunder Bay through unspoiled wilderness and completed 47 portages, totaling a distance of seven miles. In Wolseley's words, it was a feat unparalleled in our military annals. We have descended a great river, esteemed so dangerous from its rapids, falls, and whirlpools that none experienced voyagers attempt its navigation. On the evening of August 23rd, the expedition pitched camp one last time seven miles short of Fort Geary. Around midnight, Cunningham said a drenching storm of rain and thunder came on and saturated everything most effectually. It was by far the most severe storm they'd encountered since Thunder Bay. Throughout the night, lightning flashed brilliantly. Thunder shook the muddy ground like an earthquake and rain fell torrent upon torrent. The storm was relentless. At 4 a.m., the bugle sounded to start the final day, but since the camp was going the amphibious pretty successfully, Cunningham put it, Wolseley pushed departure off till 7 a.m. Luckily, the rain let off for a few brief minutes, allowing the troops to gulp a quick breakfast and pack up camp. Then the boats were loaded one last time. The rain began pounding as the force pulled upstream. St. John said everyone was in a state of mystery as to what to expect at Fort Geary. All were confident of entering as conquerors, but ignorant as to whether they were to fight or take possession peaceably. At 8.30 a.m., Wolseley ordered the boats ashore two miles north of Fort Garry at Point Douglas. The troops assembled there in battle formation, Captain Wallace's advance guard looming ahead in the mist. Next came Wolseley and his staff, dripping from every seam of their waterproof coats, and mounted on what horses Wallace was able to scrounge up. Next was the main body of the battalion and the engineers and the artillery with two carts limbering cannon. Captain Northey brought up the rear of the small guard. To the right of the formation, a number of horsemen, having some indirect connection with the expedition, had gathered and scattered all around were a number of hangers on, including Hudson's Bay men clothed in their standard issue, blue clothed, brass button compotes. When Wolseley signaled ready, McNeil galloped off to close the skirmishers, and the main body marched forward in fours from open column. With all the rain, the road was near impassable. Thick black mud, ankle deep at every step, St. John said. About 600 nor yards north of the fort, a few dozen spectators and followers were waiting to offer encouragement and guesstimates about where Louis Riel was and what he was doing. 
Wolseley ordered the battalion into open column there with the high hope that Riel would fight. All could see the north gate of the fort was shut. A large gun was mounted on barbette over it, and not a sign of a man could be seen. The soldiers marched bravely toward the fort, encouraging one another with cheers of, he's going to fight. A couple of hundred yards off, Wolseley ordered halt and sent officers McNeil, Butler, and Dennison forward to put eyes directly on the fort. They galloped off around the perimeter, and everyone held their breath. But Dennison returned just as quickly with news that the south gate was wide open. There was no sign of activity within. Wolseley ordered Wallace's skirmishers to establish a perimeter around the fort, not let anyone in or out. When the perimeter was set, Dennison, Butler, and McNeil rode back around to the south gate, and the rest of the force followed along. St. John said the soldiers cast glances up and down as if to seek the best spots for storming, but there'd be no fight today. The soldiers rounded the last bastion and the band struck up a quick step as they passed through the south gate and formed into companies on the main quadrangle. Once assembled, the officers hoisted the Union Jack up the flagstaff and while the band played God Save the Queen, the ceremony ended with a 21-gun salute. Of course, the question on everyone's minds was where's Riel? Wolseley ordered Fort Gary searched. St. John said it was in a dreadful state of mud and dirt. In the main dining room, the search party he was with found the undeclared remnants of Riel's breakfast on the table. Next door in a room used for a study, a variety of papers were found littering the table. Within a couple hours, the Royal Artillery finished taking stock of the guns and the munitions they found. 40 sidearms, 47 muskets, 20 cannon of various sizes ranging from nine to one pounders. All the guns were loaded, some to the muzzle. In addition, 300,000 rounds of ammunition and 100 barrels of powder were discovered. Cunningham thought if Riel had had the courage and system to use it, he could have blown the whole 60th into the water. There was no sign of Riel or any of his lieutenants. Writing later in the day, St. John reported on reliable authority that Riel and his men had crossed the bridge over the Assiniboine just as the expedition was passing between the town and the fort. They said Riel watched the Union Jack being hoisted from Bishop Taché's front porch and the firing of the salute and remain there for the remainder of the day and the next. The search for Riel and his men ended on the afternoon of August 24th, and at that point, Aileen and his artillerymen uh, hauled two of the captured brass six-pounders outside the walls, fired a second royal salute, and gave three cheers for the Queen <clears throat> and three for Wolseley. And so ended the taking of Fort Gary, wrote Cunningham. Cunningham described the next three weeks in Red River as a reign of terror. By September 2nd, he said he no longer felt safe. Stores and houses were being broken into, drunken revelers uh, firing off their revolvers at midday uh, on the open streets. Part of the problem was Wolseley didn't have any authority except over the expedition. <clears throat> Until the new Lieutenant Governor Adams Archibald arrived, Donald Smith had to assume temporary civic powers under the old Hudson's Bay laws. But given the recent troubles, no one wanted to serve as a magistrate or a lawman. As fast as Smith swore in special constables, Cunningham said they resigned as fast as they were called upon, out of fear of Riel and his friends. Once Archibald arrived on September 3, another problem presented itself. Wolseley's timetable for having the British soldiers depart. St. John said the imminent withdrawal of the troops stoked great fear in the locals, as both the English and the French speakers believed the Brits embodied the Queen's authority and could be trusted as they were without any partisan feeling in local matters. The same couldn't be said of the Canadian soldiers. While the volunteers might very well turn out to be well-disciplined soldiers and excellent men, St. John believed very little provocation would be needed to draw the Canadian volunteers in, which might end only in bloodshed. The only British soldiers in Red River after September 2nd were Wolseley and his five officers. The reign of terror culminated in the murder of Elzir Goulet on September the 12th. Cunningham met Goulet that morning, uh, where Goulet offered to take Cunningham to meet Riel. Cunningham had to postpone, as he had other business that day, but assured a visibly nervous Goulet he should have no fear <clears throat> of going into Winnipeg to get on with his business. The two planned to meet up later in the evening to discuss uh, meeting Riel. Assured by Cunningham, Goulet crossed the river into Winnipeg. But near one of the taverns, he was accosted by someone who asked him if he were not the man who tied the blind on Thomas Scott. 
Others heard, and Goulet ran back towards the river, fe fearing for his life. Two men from the Ontario Battalion and a third, a voyageur from the expedition, saw Goulet and gave chase. When they got to the river, Goulet jumped in and started swimming across. The two soldiers and the voyageur pelted Goulet with rocks and sticks. One hit Goulet in the head, and he sank immediately. Goulet's lifeless body was retrieved by friends and family later that day. Elzir Goulet's murder heightened fears of another insurrection and sparked the new Lieutenant Governor to action. On the 16th, Archibald appointed Manitoba's first Executive Council, and then a couple days later established the province's first police force. On the 26th, he sent a company of soldiers south to Pembina on rumors that armed Métis were gathering along the border to avenge Goulet's murder. Nothing came of the rumors. By the end of September, both St. John and Cunningham were reporting that Manitoba had become as quiet and as dull as it was before. And so with the work of reporting on the expedition having come to an end, Cunningham, St. John and Rano moved on with their lives. Covering the Red River expedition chained Robert Cunningham's life, especially his connection to Elzir Goulet. In the fall of 1870, Cunningham became co-publisher of the Manitoban, a newspaper he used to support Archibald's administration and advocate passionately for conciliation in his newly adopted home. Cunningham's efforts eventually led him to run for Parliament in 1872, where he became a vocal advocate for fair treatment of Indigenous peoples in Manitoba and the Northwest. Cunningham earned the praise and respect of the Métis community, even Louis Riel himself. The Métis leader came out of hiding to serve as a returning officer for Cunningham in 1873. Unfortunately, Cunningham's life was cut short in the fall of 1874. He died unexpectedly while returning to Manitoba to take up new duties on the Council of the Northwest Territories. Adams Archibald also drafted Molyneux and St. John into his conciliation efforts. Appointed first clerk of the Manitoba legislature, St. John was signatory to treaties one, two, and three. He continued in this line of work, serving briefly as superintendent of Indian affairs in the late 1870s. Then over the next 15 years, St. John churned through various appointments and contracts, ultimately dying in office as gentleman usher of the Black Rod in the Parliament of Canada. In the fall of 1870, Kate Rano <clears throat> returned to Montreal and her career on the stage. In the spring of 1871, she took a short break and toured a handful of Eastern Canadian cities with her public lecture, The Great Northwest. According to reviews, no copy of the lecture actually exists, Reno regaled audiences with tales of her efforts to join St. John on the trip and the difficulties she encountered overcoming the objections raised against her, uh, against her accompanying the expedition. She recalled her trips up to Kemenistiqua and from the Shabanduan to the Winnipeg, and relayed in graphic detail the picturesque scenery of the route. Renault also recounted the enthusiasm and the readiness of the volunteers to undertake the difficult expedition and, many, and the many difficulties overcome by the troops. She described the final approach to Fort Garry and testified to the order and tranquility which had rapidly succeeded to the period of disorder and passion. Renault concluded the great Northwest by demanding justice be done to the Indian and that in the future there may be no cause for reproach of conscience, and that when what is now a prairie and a wilderness becomes the garden and the wheat fields, the flowers will bloom over no grave of oppression, nor hamlet be built upon land wrenched from the Indian, but the dominion will grow based on justice and truth, and prosperity will flourish over the land. One reviewer said this generous appeal on behalf of the Indian tribes, for whom no settlement had yet been made, was met with continued applause. Renault died in Montreal in 1893. She is buried next to her husband in Montreal's Mount Royal Cemetery. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Glenn. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, my name is Scott Bradley. I'm the executive director of the Thunder Bay Museum. Um, so I would like to encourage everyone now to use the uh, Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen and please uh, enter in any questions you have for, for Mr. Glenn about this uh, great lecture. Um, and we'll just take a moment to allow everyone to uh, take some time to enter those in. And I'll start with a question that got uh, sent to me by, by text during the, uh, during the lecture. So uh, do you think that the forest fire was set deliberately or was that a natural event? 
Oh, that was a natural event. Uh, from what I understand, uh, doing some other reading, um, the area was a bit of a tinderbox that spring, and uh, it, it more than likely um, a lightning strike that set it off. Okay, great. All right, I have a question uh, that I can ask you directly. Um, about the sources that you've used in writing this. Um, we've seen a lot of really interesting images and you're certainly drawing from the writing of these people directly. Are there, um, how, how did you find working with uh, sources for this? And are there um, any unpublished works that you were able to make use of? Uh, the primary sources were this, were, uh, for, for this were the, um, the 89 articles that uh, Cunningham um, St. John and Rano published. Um, I, th I think what's interesting kind of from a historical historic, historian perspective is that the articles have been largely forgotten. Uh, nobody has gone to them, even, um, you know, some uh, uh, key writers like um, Jack Bumstead or um, George Stanley, uh, when writing about um, the expedition, they didn't go to the newspaper sources. And yet you had two uh, civilian observers there that, that provided um, pretty interesting, reliable, unique perspectives on the expedition. So, so for me, that, that was the real boon in this, is, is rediscovering all of those articles. Um, there was also like a number of the pictures that, that I use today were, were from the Canadian Illustrated News. And they, a lot of those pictures have been kind of forgotten as well. But at the time, that's, that's how everybody was, uh, you know, they were reading Cunningham and St. John's articles, and then they were looking at the pictures in the Canadian Illustrated News, and that's how Canadians were, were experiencing the expedition. So I, I found it interesting to kind of go back and, and uh, kind of feel what it was like to be a, a, your average Canadian reading the newspapers at the time about this, about this event that's going on in, in the life of the country. It was, it was the biggest event in the country's, you know, young life. So, Mr. Glenn, uh... What was the uh, kind of the time delay between um, events happening uh, in Manitoba and those appearing in the newspaper um, back further to the east? I mean, I mean this was a pretty fast uh, series of events. Um, had things kind of progressed further by the time the, uh, the news had gotten back to east? Well, so there's a couple of delays that, uh, that, that you can talk about. So the, the, the main delay, uh, you know, news from Winnipeg back east um, would be taken by train uh, uh, south from Winnipeg uh, down in through the states uh, across at Detroit and then, and then into, the, into um, the telegraph system from there. So usually it was a two, maybe three day delay from news directly from Winnipeg. But on the expedition itself, like when, when they got out onto the, um, when they left Shabandwin Lake, um, you, know, you, got, you got a picture that the expedition itself was stretched 160 miles apart, and 17 days apart, right? These 125 boats. Uh, and so what they, what they ended up doing, and, and the reporters are right at the front, they're right at the lead, the vanguard. Uh, so what Wolseley did is he actually had a mail service set up, and basically they would run all of the mail from the front to the to the back, and then they and then somebody at the back would take it back to uh, Thunder Bay, and then from there uh, they'd run it back to the Sioux, to Sault Ste. Marie, and from there from the telegraph back. So they they had a delay sometimes uh, a week and a half, two weeks uh, uh, in terms of the reports, but the delay from Winnipeg itself was was a little better. Wow, it's amazing, and just how complex that could get. The operation was was unparalleled. Like what Woolsey bragged a, a bit about it, but you know, in 1870, it, it really was uh, from a logistics point of view, it was the most complex thing that had been done to date. There was just so many me moving pieces, so many men, so much material moving through uh, uncharted areas. Uh, it was just it, it was incredible. So uh, just, to, just to remind everyone who's uh, still tuning in, uh, if you do have any questions, please do enter those into that uh, Q&A box uh, down at the bottom, um, uh, just as a reminder. Uh, Sarah, any more questions from your end? Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm just thinking that um, some of the people attending tonight might also be um, familiar with the 1885 um, expedition as well, and the uh, way that linked in with railway construction and things like that. I'm wondering if you've done, if you've looked at comparisons between those or... Um... It was so much easier. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Canadian Army got on the train and, and rode out to the prairies and they were up there in you know, about three days. So <laughs> by comparison, it was, uh, it, it, was, it was much easier. But what, what's actually in, an interesting comparison, so that, that Red River expedition of 1870 was followed up again in 1871. Uh, and that expedition was sent out because of the, the Fenian threat. And so they wanted to get more soldiers out. And that 1871 expedition, you know, where, where um, uh, Wolseley's 1870, you know, was between, uh, you know, once they actually got underway in July 16 to, to August 23rd, they cut that down, down by half uh, just one year later. Um, so, you know, they, they had made that route so much more uh, efficient uh, in a very, very short amount of time. Because the second time through, I mean, they didn't have to cut uh, portages. They didn't have to, to, to dredge out parts of the, the, the Muskeg kind of parts of the French River and stuff. So it was a much easier route. But yeah, the 1885 was, a, was a, getting out there was a cakewalk by comparison. Well, it doesn't seem as though we have any other questions coming in at this point. So I think um, we can all thank you very, very much for presenting tonight, um, applaud you from our own homes and uh, thank everyone who attended. Um, hope that you enjoyed this and hope that you're able to, um, to come back for more uh, next month as well. So I'll end the recording and- uh, Thank you very much for your time. All right.